We're going to take you through the hamstring, just the anatomy and how we translate it into the ultrasound and what details we can get about muscle tendon, muscular tendonous junction. Um, MRI is still the gold standard in, in imaging hamstrings. And as we probably all know, in sport medicine, there's a lot of discussion about how do we translate imaging into information we can use for return to play. Um, that always surprises me because as a clinician, you always, always, always combine function, structure and symptoms. So why would you always look at the structure only and then determine everything from there? That doesn't make sense at all. It's like looking at a car and at the engine and then you know how the driver will, will behave in the, in the car. So bear that in mind when you do ultrasound that what you do is you just gather information. And ultrasound is quite good at that. You can, you can push, you can pull, you can stretch. Um, and if you have an MRI, then compare it with the MRI. The technology is getting really good where you can get fusion, which means you can do the MRI and overlap it with ultrasound. That it gives us a little bit more insight where the strength and the, and the weaknesses are of ultrasound. But it will only get better, so it gets closer together. Uh, and ultrasound is a clinical tool, uh, because I'm a, I'm a clinician not in sport medicine. I don't have an MRI scan just next to me the whole time. So most of us will either have to do a clinical assessment or, if you're lucky, an MRI, but you don't normally have a follow-up for that. So you need to have a tool that you can have a little bit more structural information about the healing or complications uh, that you might get from your muscle injury. And that is not specific to the hamstring. There's, there's, there's issues about any, any muscle structure. Um, it will always be a challenge what you're going to do with your, your patient at any stage. And, and again, the ultrasound is just an information gathering tool. What you actually should do is be confident with, with what you assess and then start querying what you do with it. That's the difficulty. It's not difficult to see what you see. It's what you do with it. So all we do now is just go through what you see and, and just get your head around it. If you're familiar with it, practice it a lot. You need to be good at it. Okay, so hamstring. Uh, there's lots of papers and a lot of research done on it over the years. This, this goes back a long time, this 2003, and they were just saying how many recurrences there are, re-injuries in, in, in a few weeks after uh, going back to play. The question is, are they, are they re-injuring? or are they maybe not healed yet, or are we pushing them too hard? All the questions I can't give you an answer to immediately, but imaging can help you maybe to hold them back a bit longer or not, or make it at least a decision on where that goes, a bit more on the basis of information you need to, to consider. So let me go through a few anatomical uh, um, uh, considerations. So the proximal hamstring, hamstring attachment, conjoined tendon with the biceps and the semitendinosus, the semimembranosus lies, lies, lies just next to it. There's some great papers on that if you're interested in the details of that. Um, consider the sacrotubural ligament. Uh, that is an interesting one from an uh, imaging point of view that apparently sometimes can be involved. Uh, and adductor magnus is one to bear in mind as well when you start scanning. Okay, MRI, as I said, was the image of choice. So, um, when we do that, the, the sacrotubural ligament is considered to be on top of the biceps semitendinosus uh, tendon attachment there in the cross section. It would be where that blue line is, but we can't really differentiate it very well on ultrasound. Uh, this is the paper that uh, pointed that out. I think it's a very useful one. Um, and as they point out there in the middle, uh, you can see the tendons. Uh, if, if the sacrotubural ligament is involved, you, you strip it totally off the bone. But if it's not, there's still a chance that it hangs, in there, hangs on the, to the bone. Uh, so that makes maybe a surgical uh, decision easier. Okay, now we, we teach in our courses the hamstring regularly uh, in our advanced, at our advanced course and where you should start is, is at this picture. So you go slightly distal from the attachment. And the reason for doing that is because for, for this you can start mapping out all your soft tissue landmarks and once you've got them, you confidently, individually can trace them up or down. And that, that A is important if you have scar tissue, old injuries or, or a fresh injury, you need to get your markers right. So what we do, uh, uh, we start with is first of all see on the, on the medial side how big the uh, adductor magnus is. Follow with your probe until you find the the, the blue line there, the, the fascial sheet there between the semitendinosus and the, and the adductor magnus, and then you should follow the deep fascia there with the semimembranosus tendon, the blue dot. Then you follow the fascial plane, identify the, the sciatic nerve, and if if you uh, um, Often you see the, the biceps uh, tendon there on top, the conjoined tendon, and then you should follow it through the lateral side until you see the end of that compartment. Doesn't matter if you start medial or lateral, you want to confirm yourself from one to the other. You should see that fascial compartment with those markers in it. And now, once you have the, uh, that in your head, you can start and start evaluate what's going on from there. Yeah? One, one thing to bear in mind is if you go proximal, those tendons don't stay parallel. So there's a bit of a rotational pattern that come, goes around. 
Um, so this is the paper that, that uh, uh, nicely points that out. But when you scan, just bear in mind that you follow the anatomy. So although this, this, this tells you what's going to happen when you follow it, you can see it in front of your eyes. So once you have that starting point we just had, pick up the structure, follow it proximally. Yeah? And you can anticipate what happens, but let, let it just happen in front of your eyes. You follow the anatomy. So if we take it into, into account, start with the bottom picture there. Um, the medial side is on the right side in this case. And then the, the, the orange and blue dots are starting to sort of orientate themselves differently. Okay, the sciatic nerve is pretty much in the same orientation. So as you go proximal, they sort of curve a bit around them, and, and the footprint on the bone is indeed with the semimembranosus a bit more uh, on the ne next to the sciatic nerve in the fascial plane, a bit more down the slope of the, of, the, of the bone. But if you start in that musculotendinous junction, you need to start there because you, you, you need to see the musculotendinous junction. Otherwise, you end up just at the proximal bit, but you don't know what the whole story is. And if you start proximal, it's much harder to trace it back. And any muscle you do, you need to do muscle tendinous junction all the way up to the tendon. It's the same with the Achilles. It's the same with anything you do. You need to not just make it too short. You need to make the whole uh, uh, structure. Because one of the things they say with MRI, it shows a better uh, picture on, on the whole structure. But I think we also need to get better at scanning the whole structure through so we pick up on the details a bit more consistently. Okay, so once more, that is your starting point. Then you go up twists around a little bit, and then you end up in the footprint. Now, with ultrasound, this is an old image on the, on the bottom of the picture. You can't see the differentiation there on the left side, on the cross-section, but with the good machines, you should see the difference between the semimembranosus and a separate <coughs> conjoined tendon uh, more on top. And then the sciatic nerve in that fascial plane should also be visible, to the point that if you, if you want, then you've got your marker for your sciatic nerve. You can go up in a piriformis, or you can go down. You, once you have it, you should be able to follow it. Yeah, so this is once more the summary of what, what, what you need to do. You start on the right bottom and you just work your way up. Okay, the adduct adductor magnus uh, was mentioned at one point when you scan uh, uh, hamstrings. That is partly because if you do have proximal hamstring pain, it could potentially be the adductor magnus tendon attachment. So for that reason, they, they now suggest that you also identify and follow the adductor magnus to its attachment so you have a different child diagnosis and, and understand that there might be an overlap with the symptoms that the patient uh, comes, comes to your clinic with. Okay? And to do that, you start the same place as we did earlier, and you pick up the, the tendon normally on the deep part there of, of, of the semimembranosus uh, fascia. And if you don't see immediately a tendon there, don't worry, just go a bit more proximal. And you start to see from, the, from within the muscle the tendon sort of evolving close to the, like I said, to that fascial plane. And then you just follow it up, all the way up to the attachment. But get your eye on it first there, and then it's easy to, to follow up. Then there's no guesswork, and you can see what happens. There's quite often some, some irregularities at the bony attachment. That's not uncommon. Uh, again, that is for you to interpret but just make sure that you're familiar, <coughs> familiar with that uh, uh, landmark as well. Yeah, and this is the MRI uh, comparison. This is the footprint there in the middle picture uh, to show you what, what the distance is between the conjoined tendon on the, on the left side of the mountain, the ultrasound picture, and the top of it is the adductor magnus. The nice papers that, 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 uh, that you can look at if you want to uh, go a bit deeper into anatomy. <coughs> okay, so, Let's pick them up once, one at a time, infratendinous, semitendinous, intramuscular tendons, or the strata as they call that. So you, you, you pick that up by going up and down from the starting point. If you go distally, it will go from that corner of the semitendinosus more into the muscle. And it's, it's not only a good landmark, you need to scrutinize that one for injuries because there can be quite muscular tendinous sort of issues with that. So it's go up and down slowly and, and visualize it quite well. The nice thing with ultrasound is you can push it a bit, you can flatten the fascial planes out, you can see what happens when you do that. Um, it's a very nice landmark. So even if you uh, get confused, that is a nice way of finding your way back. And that's the same with tendinosa. So we start there and you follow it distally and it just gets, the, the, the strata gets more and more into the middle of the, uh, of the muscle. Um, it's just a nice way to, to do it. There's, there it goes and it comes up. That's the same membranosus, and then the next one is the strata going on the right side there of my picture in that particular there. So that's your strata going all the way to the corner and back. So it's up and down, up and down. It's a very nice marker, and you get your confidence to do it uh, hold on, quite nicely there. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's what you do with the semitendinosus. You identify the starting point as we did. You go distally, and you see the muscle just forming in front of your eyes. 
that's, that's another one there. We just did that video, so I won't do it again. And then we're back to where we started, and now we pick up another structure, uh, the semimembranosus. So we know that the fascia there, the, the, the blue line, is the, is the tendon, and with the, 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 the more pronounced tendon itself as a, as a more uh, uh, confined spot uh, in, in, this, uh, in that fascial plane. Once you have it there, you can go up or down, as I said, but if you go down distally, then we're waiting for the muscular tendinous junction. So we, the, the muscle itself starts to push itself between the adductor magnus and the semitendinosus. All you need to do is find this starting point, go distally, and wait for the little belly to push itself between the fascial planes. It varies a little bit. Some people have it much more proximal, much more distal. But of course, if you have an injury, that's a muscular tendinous junction injury. It's slightly different than if it's high up in the tendon. So that's the identification. And that just gets bigger and bigger, the semimembranosus, semi as you go uh, distally. Yeah? And I appreciate that it gets bigger and bigger uh, as it keeps getting bigger. So now you're in more the mus muscular uh, uh, compartment there. And again, if you're not sure, you should be able to go from the medial side to the lateral side and identify each compartment by just following the fascial lines. Yeah? That's, again, what we did there. Okay, now the long head and the short head of the biceps. Again, if we start by proximal, where we were before, we already have the conjoined tendon, the orange, orange dot. We already have on the, on the lateral side the, the, the fascial plane of the biceps there. So what you do, you identify the lateral compartment, uh, where the, the long head of the biceps is, and then you go distally. And as you go distally, and you just follow that, that, that uh, compartment, the, the short head will push itself between the vastus lateralis and, and the uh, long head, and it just gets bigger. And we refer to that as tram lines because the fascial planes are quite parallel in most cases. You might have to change your probe position to really visualize those fascial planes or push a little bit to see the different compartments moving. But now you know with confidence which one is the long head, which one is the short head. So don't start too distally. Start and figure out where that short head starts and then just follow it through. There's a lot of discussion about the T-junction injuries where the, the long head of the biceps and the short head of the biceps uh, meet each other on the fascial plane. But don't start there, evaluate the whole, the whole structure. Fairly easy once you get the landmark, but take, take your time to, to do it uh, uh, consistently. And that just gets, of course, the short head stays nice and big as you go nearer the knee. The, the long head starts to get uh, smaller and forms the fascia, fascia or the tendon uh, as we go distally. It forms the tendon on top of the surface and the long, the long head is then gone. The short head will stay a muscle just before it, it hits the, uh, the fibula and then becomes the, the tendon. It's, it's a nice way to go all the way up and down. You don't miss anything and you get all the information you need. We'll do this in a demo a little bit, little bit more in detail when I go in there. Um, there is still an, an, a note to make on the insertion of the biceps uh, on the fibula where it cr crosses uh, uh, through the uh, LCL, um, the, the lateral, lateral collateral ligament, which is probably easy to show when we do the demo. Okay. So that's the long head, and that was the, the, uh, the short head story. Uh, that was the biceps that we did. That's the paper that tells you how the anatomy works with the LCL uh, going on either side of the bellies of the, uh, um, and the tendon of the biceps. Okay. The posterior lateral knee, I want to just briefly mention, there are some papers that will tell you that you can do ultrasound investigation of all the ligaments on the posterior lateral side, but MRI is uh, uh, by far the, the choice of imaging on that one. So if you do anatomical studies, you might, might be able to differentiate some of the ligaments, but it's not an easy one, and I would not recommend that you get into the detail there, use an MRI for the posterior lateral corner. Um, for the medial side, the distal semimembranosus and the semitendinosus. So the way we approach that is that you start just above the knee where <laughs> we see the semitendinosus on top as a tendon and the semimembranosus is still very much a big muscle belly. Get that as, as your marker and then it's very straightforward. You, you, do, you go directly distally, don't change your probe angle and what you then <coughs> go, go through is the back of the knee. And that is nice because you end up in the uh, area where you assess for Baker cyst. So this is the easy way to get to a good position every time you do it. Uh, you, you go distally, then what you want to see is the femur condyle with the articular cartilage and the capsula on top, semimembranosus tendon on top of that, and the semitendinosus on that. And then you just have to appreciate the, the medial gastroc is, is next door to it. So your baker cyst will be between that area. So that's the ultrasound, and that's the uh, MRI. So you need to identify your femur condyle there nice and bright. So you can see the capsula and the tendon and the Baker cyst, if it's there, you, you, you can't miss it. Okay, and that, that's the approach on the, on the medial side. That's the MRI as a comparison, how that would look, uh, compared to the ultrasound. 
It's not the same client because there's no baker sits there on the right, but just to give you an idea of the orientation. Okay, and the last thing for that is that um, when we teach people, we, we often get questions about how that works on the, on the, on the tendon attachments there, the distal hamstring, and the, the semi member nose is a very good example um, how anatomy is nice. It, it blends in different layers, and that's, that's, that's a lot of places in the body where it does that. It does the rotator cuff, it does it around the ankle, it does it certainly around the postural medial knee. So go away from your left side there, that is too simple. Even the middle of the picture, you know, it explains how the, the MCL has slips to the capsula and how the meniscus is attached to that, but also how the, uh, the semi membranosus has many slips coming through and attached to that unit. It's very functional, very good, but with ultrasound we can see some of that, not everything, but it does explain why some of our clients with either distal hamstring or meniscus or simply postromedial uh, symptoms don't do as well as we think. And that's because maybe it's a combination of those factors and we just simplify it. Maybe it's not just the hamstring, maybe it's a capsular or a meniscus component that keeps driving the symptoms there. So we need to look a bit closer at those injuries and not simplify it too much. And the ultrasound is a good way of getting a bit closer to that. And MRI is not always uh, um, any better than, than an ultrasound. And this, this is the, uh, the papers that have to sort of explained how you get that interaction between meniscus, capsula, and uh, the, the semimembranosus as a functional unit. They're quite common. They're, they're the ones that sometimes come back after arthroscopy when the medial meniscus is ad addressed with arthroscopy, and they still have ongoing symptoms on the postural medial uh, knee. Uh, there might be a group that simply we need to look at again. Yeah? So that's, that's the round trip of the hamstring. Um, the, 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 we haven't done nerves with this one, but the sciatic nerve could be a part of your hamstring assessment uh, because obviously you can get scar tissues, you can get all, all kinds of things that might irritate the, the, the nerve there as well. It's a big nerve, we can certainly scan it, but that's, that's not for now because we're doing the muscle. Is that quick? Yeah. Okay. So this was a quick round trip, I just wanted to, wanted to go through. Uh, we do the demo and we'll do some practicals uh, from, from that as well. I want to also just briefly do the lateral hip. Um, and the lateral hip, the, the glutea, gluteus minimus, medius, and then also simply the, how the complex uh, works with the two layers, tensor fasciolata, gluteus uh, maximus on top. We have, we have looked at it when we do our courses, and the way we teach it is uh, quite a systematic approach. And the, the paper that was recently sort of reviewing that anatomy um, gave us a bit more of an insight how, how we should scan it, but way, with the way we teach it is, is already doing it in that uh, sense. I'll show you one second. Let me just get this up. Is it already up? Sorry. Yeah. Um, some people need, need to look a little bit closer how we, how we make a, a judgment on how we approach the lateral hip. So, this was a long time ago, I saw in a, a presentation, uh, 2009 it was, where they um, explained sort of the, the anatomy. So you, with an ultrasound we want to get a cross section and we want to get, first of all, our landmark is the anterior facet, which is a concave facet, and then the convex, more lateral uh, uh, facet, and the posterior facet has a slightly different sloped uh, 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 con contour. So the cross section is what you need to find on the ultrasound first. Okay, and this is the, the, the more recent paper that, that sort of went a little bit more in detail how to go about uh, scanning it well and the MRI comparison. I just want to point out as well that on the bottom picture when you see the MRI, if you go a bit deep to that, you can see nicely the, the, the joint line there as well. So with a good scanner, you can actually not just see the tendons, but go quite nice and deep to see the capsule out of the hip joint. So the, the, the minimus is the easiest and the, and the quickest way to find by finding the anterior facet, and if you do that in a cross section, you will see the footprint, the transverse footprint of the glutinous minimus. All we then need to do, spin on it 90 degrees, and then you follow it down, and you get a typical sort of contour, like the middle picture there, with the two bellies of the muscle following through from there. That's a fairly straightforward one, partly because the, the anterior facet is, for most people, quite easily recognized. When you go to the glute min medius, it has two uh, tendons we need to address. And the, 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 the first one we do is the anterior band, and it's there where some people uh, struggle a bit to get a good picture, and that's because of the orientation of what is that orange footprint there. So if you're in transverse, which we started with for the, for the glute minimus, 
you now need to just adjust your probe position to get a good transverse view on the footprint of, the, of that anterior band. And they've done, they've done, like I said, a few papers on it that really explain that. You need to do 37 degrees angling it to get it right. Well, the way we teach it is if you don't angle it, it doesn't look good. If you think of it as a shoulder, if you do a transverse uh, view of your supraspinatus, if you get it wrong, it looks pointy at one end. It's like the tendon stops. It's because you're, you haven't lined it up properly. If you line it up properly, it's a parallel band of tissue uh, over the bone, so it's a parallel band. And it's the same with this one. So if you get it wrong, you get a pointy bit on one end. Just adjust your, your probe, about 37 degrees, and you will get a nice band of tissue over the bone. And if you get that right, you pretty much also see the posterior facet there as a more sloped uh, posterior uh, contour of the bone. And then you know you're in the right place. And again, then you can scrutinize that in transverse, or you spin on it to get a longitudinal. So take your time to get that, that orientation right, because that, ma that makes everything else easier. So either from this transverse position, you can then spin on the, on the anterior band, but also if you then rotate a bit further posterior, you're already on, on the, uh, postural, uh, sorry, the superior, postural superior part of that facet, where you then can spin on the other tendon. So this is the longitudinal, as the picture in the middle says, and the MRI comparison on the bottom, and that is the superior one. So if I do one more, one more, so you go, if you look on the left side there, your orientation of your probe, that's longitudinal, and all you do is move it up in the same orientation and you're done on the other, other one. Yeah? So it's just, don't make the mistake of being too quick. Just line it up properly and your work is pretty much done then. And if you do do a longitudinal, you might have to push your probe in a little bit because those tendons do dive deep, so they are quite oblique. So work sometimes a bit harder to do that, or make sure that if the patient is really tight, put a pillow uh, between their legs so they're not as tight, so you can use your probe better. And what you look for is, is like with any tendon, you look for bony irregularities, tendon thickening, anything that tendinopathy would, would show. Um, it's quite common to see some changes and irregularities around the bone, but not so much bursitis. That's not so common. And there are quite a few bursts that, that have been uh, uh, documented around the hip. I would say wherever there's a sliding plane between two muscles or a bone and a muscle, you probably find some uh, bursts of fluid. So I wouldn't really look for every individual bursa, but just see it as sliding planes between two <coughs> soft tissues. And uh, this is a paper that sort of pointed out how we do see gluteus me medium tendinosis, but we don't really often see bursitis at all or even a combination of tendinosis and, and bursitis. So it really uh, started to show how, and this is about uh, uh, five, six years ago, how all, all that time when we were injecting and looking at uh, bursitis and lateral hip, we were basically not looking or injecting bursitis. We were probably just addressing what is more likely to be tendinosis. It doesn't mean that an injection can't solve any pain that is there, but we miss diagnosis. And I want to point that out because I'm a, I'm a clinician and the number of uh, patients I got through the door that were injected with a, with a diagnosis of bursitis when it is not bursitis. It's not even a swollen bursa, it's nothing. So that is a misdiagnosis, it's a different thing. If it's tendinopathy, we do something different than if it's a bursitis. In, 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 in sport medicine, you should treat that differently. Other than for pain management, you can do an injection. Um, the same in the shoulder, you know, how many people do, do a bursal injection if it's just pain and there's no sign of bursal fluid ex ex extension? Uh, it can still help with the pain, but you, you're actually misdiagnosed if, you, if it's not a proper bursitis. Um, so just bear that in mind as clinicians, we need to be a bit more careful in what we say it is. Then the, the superficial layer, so once, we have, once we've assessed the deep layer, then we can also assess the superficial layer uh, that that's, has a frictional plane between the two. And uh, so you get the fascia lata over that uh, superficial layer, so over the deep layer, and then you can assess that by just dynamic scanning. And you see the two planes moving quite nicely. The tensor fascia lata muscle, of course, is on the anterior side, uh, gluteus maximus on the posterior side. And just allow the, the movements. The, the nice thing is you can let the patient often do all the movement and you just hold your probe still. And you just see this, the sliding planes. It's quite nice. Um, what you see in terms of structural changes, there can be thickening, there can be nothing. You might just look absolutely fine. Um, but it's a nice way of having not only the deep structures but also the superficial structures looked at in one nice examination. Um, and this is how we normally scan it, lying on the side, and you let the patient do the work. 
And I think this is a, is this one working? So you just let, let the layers move over each other. We'll do it in a minute in practice. There you go. So you just move over. Now you go to the front, and then you do it there. You can do it at any stage. Just look at the two layers moving over each other. And move a bit more forwards. That's the anterior facet coming up there, and then you just move it over there. Yeah? You get the idea. That's just... But the patient is moving, so you don't have to do much with your probe. Okay. And the last mentioning around the lateral hip is sometimes you get these people with very pronounced, very local pain uh, around the pelvis, and they're just the, uh, the tenor or sal area of the tendons there. You can see that really nicely with ultrasound. They, uh, they can be quite persistent in terms of symptoms, although that is not officially the lateral hip, it's just the lateral area, and it's more the pelvis. Ultrasound has a very nice way of pointing out what's going on there, and that they, they stand out very well. Uh, they're quite, like I said, stubborn to treat, but an explanation for the pain, you can see what's, what's going on there at the attachment quite quickly. So what I want to do is, is uh, go over the hamstring uh, and then just do a demo, and hopefully we have time to do the lateral hip as well. And then we, after lunch, we can all practice it a bit. 